difficult to think about why you'd have freedom of speech unless you were engaged in communication with others. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of First Amendment Museum's one-on-one -on -one series. I'm Max Nospich, the Manager of Education and Visitor Experiences here at the First Amendment Museum. Today, I'm joined by our wonderful guest, John Ethan, who is volunteering his time to talk to us a little bit about freedom of association. So, Professor Finn, if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thanks, Max. I'm happy to be here, and I appreciate the invitation. I, I taught constitutional law for I guess nearly 40 years at Wesleyan University. Um, was trained uh, in law school and then in graduate school. And I've had an abiding interest in the First Amendment pretty much for that entire time. So I'm very happy to be here and anxious to talk to you. Excellent. So let's jump right in. Why is the First Amendment important? Well, you know, I'm sure you've asked that question lots of times, and I'm sure you, by now you probably have the standard answers down pretty pat. Uh, marketplace of ideas, pursuit of truth, checking theory, safety valve theory, democratic functioning, all of those. And th those are all true, I think. They're all pretty good, reasonable explanations about why the First Amendment is so important. But I think there's another one that we sometimes forget, and that is that the First Amendment doesn't just have a legal significance or even just a political significance, although it certainly has both. It also has a cultural significance. The First Amendment is a critical part of what it means to live in a constitutional democracy and one that is characterized by high levels and informed levels of civic engagement. Then the First Amendment, by definition, should have some kind of great significance to everybody, not just to lawyers and judges or to politicians, but to everybody who wants to be a member of the community. To my way of thinking, the First Amendment is a mechanism for storytelling. And the stories are about who we are collectively, what we believe. The First Amendment makes that possible and it's autobiographical. It tells us who we are and allows us to, to think about who we are and to put who we are up for questioning and re-engagement for each generation. Excellent, and I will say, uh, yeah, you skipped all the common, typical answers I get and gave me a different <laughs> one, so I appreciate that. Thanks. So what is freedom of association? Uh, well, it would help if the First Amendment told us, but like most important questions, the Constitution's more silent than it is vocal. Um, it's also a fairly recent vintage, I should say. So if you want to check out what the Supreme Court has to say about freedom of association, you don't have to go back very far. There aren't many cases of any significance before the 1950s. Uh, and in those early cases, the court defined freedom, as so freedom of association as a right to engage with other individuals to express our opinions, whether those opinions need to be about politics, culture, religion, art, music, has always been kind of an open question. In its early iterations, the Supreme Court seemed to adopt a really expansive notion of freedom of association, of association the right to engage with like-minded individuals for almost any purpose whatsoever. But it's the freedom to associate with others to exchange information. And as, if you define it in that way, you can see that it, although it's not textually a part, an explicit part of the First Amendment, it's almost by definition a necessary part. It's difficult to think about why you'd have freedom of speech unless you were engaged in communication with others. Speech presumes communication with others. Petition, assembly, all of those seem to imply almost by necessity some kind of associational right. And I don't think it's any surprise that that's the direction the court has taken it. So what are some key court cases pertaining to freedom of association that everyone should know, sort of the highlights? Sweezy and NAACP versus Alabama are probably the two foundational cases. I say foundational in the sense that they made it clear, I think beyond purview, that there is some kind of associational right. Um, but there are, there are other cases as well. Um, I tend to think of the cases as falling into three broad kind of categories. One is what's included and what's not included. If, um, a second line of cases involves freedom of non-association, which might be my favorite topic to think about. And then there's a third line of cases that concern when it's okay or when it might be permissible for the state to restrict or to limit the right of association. So going back to the first, what's included and what's not included, um, 
NAACP versus Alabama, like I said, was a very expansive case. It, there's no hint there anywhere that freedom of association wouldn't extend to any kind of association you can think of. And I think that's the sense in which de Tocqueville, when he wrote about the importance of freedom of association, was conceptualizing the freedom too. But as I said, in recent years, the court has begun to walk that back a little bit. And there is an enduring open question about whether the First Amendment generally and association in particular should extend only to political forms of association or whether it should include all these other kinds of forms of association. So I want to say two things about that. First, I don't put a whole lot of stock in our ability to consistently define what political forms of association are versus non-political forms of association. That distinction has always struck me as deeply troublesome. Um, and every time somebody gives me an example of, well, this is non-political, it seems just almost like child's play to say, no, that's obviously political and here are the reasons why. Um, the court has instead tended to distinguish between what it calls expressive association, maybe political association fits into that category, and intimate association. So you might describe intimate association as being family relationships, for example, and most of the time, the court's willing to protect that, but there is this persistent line or persistent thread of judicial opinion that suggests that maybe it's really only political association that ought to be protected. So think freedom of expressive association for grand things, maybe politics, maybe business, other kinds of things. And then think of intimate associations, you, me, uh, romantic relationships, friendships, civic organizations, or maybe interest groups like, you know, the Golf Club Owners of America or something like that. I think it's reasonably clear that most of the court wants to protect both forms of association, but it's always a question in the background. Um, another key case there is my most favorite case, uh, which is Dallas versus Stangle. Dallas is right at the margins of freedom of association jurisprudence. So I love this case. It's, it's Footloose, the movie, brought to life. So Dallas passes a law that says only certain aged kids can attend what are called dancing clubs or dancing parties. These are commercial establishments, apparently. And they can only attend them during certain periods of time. And adults of a certain age can't attend them at all, or if they can, only at certain periods of time. And the owners of these clubs and some of the kids involved brought suit saying, look, by restricting who can attend these parties and restricting who can attend them at certain times, you're restricting our freedom of association. That seems to work for me. Um, but the court said, look, the rule is expressive association or intimate association. So let's plug in the categories. Is a dance party, a commercially funded, you know, held dance party, expressive association? And the court says, maybe you'd expect an older court to say something like this. Well, there's nothing expressive, at least politically, about dancing. And I'm thinking somebody should tell Kevin Bacon that. But the court wasn't buying it. And then it said, and there's nothing intimate about it because we're talking about thousands of kids together, right? And you could see this image that the court might have had of, oh no, these kids are raving or whatever, right? But there's nothing remotely. And the court says, sorry, there's no serious freedom of association claim here. That tells me that there are still cracks in this intimate versus expressive dichotomy and that certain forms of association might get left by the wayside, just as just as Potter Stewart suggested many years ago. I love Dallas versus Stang. I mean, how often do you get a Supreme Court case that really does look like a movie? And this one does. Yeah, and I remember that one from uh, the great course that stuck out in my mind as well. <laughs> um, so uh, freedom of association is not expressly written in the First Amendment but many acknowledge it as a right or freedom in the United States. How is that possible? Okay, so, you know, it, I used to use this as a final exam question in some way, so I'm really glad you asked me that. Um, uh, most students of constitutional law are familiar with another case that actually is, I think, or can be conceptualized as a freedom of association case, Griswold versus Connecticut, the case in the 1960s where the Supreme Court struck down a Connecticut law regarding contraceptives and information about pregnancy. And most of us treat that as a First Amendment case or as a privacy case, um, but there's an associational claim involved, the association between husband and wife or between um, you know, a heterosexual couple that's concerned about pregnancy. 
or between the couple or the woman and her doctor. So there are associational elements here. But the reason I think it's a great case to think about why association is protected is that everybody remembers Griswold for this almost bizarre formulation by Justice Douglas about the numbers and emanations. And to this day, people like to look at Griswold and say, all right, look, there's no right to privacy. The court's just flat out making it up and using all this obtuse language to justify it. But that is the exact same logic, only doesn't sound as weird when we're talking about freedom of association. There is no explicit right to freedom of association as we talked about before. If you're going to get there, you have to read it into the Constitution, or if you prefer, read it from the Constitution. But there, nobody seems particularly distressed, right? I mean, you think about petition, assembly, religion, all of those seem almost inevitably to imply a cognate right of people to get together, to congregate, to associate. Nobody seems to think that is an, ex, you know, an, an absurd extension of the language. It seems like a natural implication of the language. And I think it is, but it doesn't strike me as considerably more natural than saying there's a right to privacy. And indeed, you know, perhaps on a different time and a different day, we can talk about just how closely related associational rights are to privacy rights more generally. But that that's, I think, the logic there. Uh, that's an, uh, interesting. And and thank you for explaining, because I didn't even know that, you know, I'm always unclear about how, where they sort of extrapolate things like freedom of association and right to privacy and stuff like that. I'm no constitutional scholar, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so uh, how do you use your First Amendment freedoms in your everyday life? Um. Uh, I'll bet you've heard some version of this answer before too. I'm a writer, right? I'm an academic. I, I can't imagine doing what I do without freedom of speech. Um, um, so I, but that strikes me as being almost kind of formal in some ways. Remember earlier, earlier I talked about the importance of autobiography and storytelling. I think that's what good citizenship is partly about. The, the process of engaging with each other and trying to reason with each other and persuade each other can often be described as this kind of formalistic, the exchange of reason and rationales. And, but, but real people do this through telling stories. And that's how I like to teach. That's how I like to interact with other individuals. And the First Amendment makes that possible. And it also imposes an, an obligation on the rest of us to take the project of civic education and constitutional literacy more seriously than we have for a very long time. And sort of in the same vein, um, Professor Finn, do you have any final messages, final thoughts, uh, ways people can learn more, get in touch, see the work you do, sort of your open mic moment? The open mic moment. Um, I'm an author, so buy my books. Uh, no, don't buy them. Get the library to buy them and then and then read them. Um, if you're interested in, in how the First Amendment can be a danger, uh, as well as a salve for constitutional democracy, then... I guess I'd like to encourage people to take a look at my newest book, Fracturing the Founding, which talks about how the Constitution can be a double-edged sword for maintaining constitutional democracy. But what I really would like people to do is to read anybody they can find who talks about the Constitution as something that belongs to us all. Um, I, I have spent all of my professional career absolutely persuaded that the Constitution needs to be made public. And by that, I simply mean we have an obligation to ourselves and to our posterity to make sure that everybody is constitutionally literate. It's, it's, a primary, it's of primary importance in a healthy constitutional democracy that people assume some personal responsibility for understanding what the system is, where it is flawed, where it is commendable, and how it can be improved. And that's something that we can't just leave to lawyers, we can't just leave to judges, we can't just leave to academics. It has to be a public responsibility. Excellent, well, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you, it's been a pleasure.